Investing is one of those things for which we can be so arrogant that even if we know the mistakes we should avoid, we still fall into the traps over and over before finally learning. So in today's video, I decided to tell you about the biggest mistakes that I've made in my life. Prepare pen and paper, and above all, don't be shy and let us know with a comment which of these mistakes you made and which one has been the biggest wealth destructor in your life. What's up everyone? My name is Rick, your Italian investor and twin of Mano Ginobili, and I'm gonna start with a rule that I learned and it cost me a lot of money in the past. Stocks don't do better in a better economy. If you read financial news online, you always read something like, the economy is going good, buy stocks, or the economy is going bad, sell stocks. <sighs> Wrong. The truth is, if you wanna make the biggest gains going forward, you wanna buy into a bad economy. One where economic growth is zero or possibly even lower. Look at what's happening now. Everybody's waiting for the Fed to cut interest rates, but the economic recovery, including the one that still has to happen in the future, has already been priced into the current market. This table shows you the average one-year return since 1947, one year after the GDP has been below zero or above 6%, as well as the global average by buying and holding. The lesson here is clear. When the economy is doing great, chances are stocks will underperform over the next year. When the economy is doing badly, chances are you'll do very well in stocks over the next year. You see, my mistake in the past was that I was always buying when the economy was good and I wasn't doing anything out of fear when the economy was bad. Economic conditions get priced in in advance to the stock market, so you wanna buy when things don't look so good. My second mistake was a deadly sin called pride, or you can call it arrogance. You know how almost everyone with a driving license thinks he's an above average driver? Well, that's what I thought about myself with investing. I'm very good with numbers, I know how to read financial statements, so I can pick the best stocks. No, you can't, Rick. You can't. At least not so well in the long term. I've made some really, really good investments in my past by picking stocks, but most of the time, when I was trying to find unicorns that weren't as famous as Apple or Microsoft, and they had the potential to grow tenfold or hundredfold, well, they didn't. So if you're a stock picker, or even if you invest in ETFs, but you're always looking for specific ETFs like AI ETFs, trying to catch the last trend, you should only invest in what you really know. And believe me, there is a lot you don't know for most companies. Third mistake, not having a plan. We don't have to be terrible investors, right? Sometimes we even pick the right stocks or the right ETFs. But even when we make the right decisions, if we don't have a clear idea what our long-term plan is gonna be, we're gonna end up selling low and losing money. Up until a couple of years ago, I didn't really have a long-term strategy that I set myself to follow. In fact, three years ago, I basically had to start from scratch. I was buying stocks because I believed it was a good decision, but then I sold them after a couple of months, sometimes days, because I changed my mind about the decision. And I'm not kidding, sometimes I sold them really a couple of days later. And this brings me right away to mistake number four, which was buying and selling in the short term. Never invest short term always invest in the long term. Shifting back and forth leave you with empty pockets. Morningstar, in a study from August 2023, found that investors who moved in and out of ETFs enjoyed much less returns than by simply staying invested in those ETFs. What they found was that the average fund gained about 7.7% over the 10 years ended in 2022, while the average dollar invested in funds earned a 6% annual return per year for a gap of about 1.7% annually. What this means is that investors missed out on about one-fifth of their fund's average returns. This is partially due to bad timing, but a big problem lies in the fees that incur with every transaction. Rule number five, you can't beat the market. People much better than you and me have been trying for years. Most of them failed. I'm not saying don't try, it's just unlikely that you will beat the market. When we talk about beating the market, we actually mean beating the market in a long period of time, at least for a time of, let's say, 10 years. And why am I saying this? Because many times I've beaten the market for one year with single stocks, including this year. But it's not really useful to beat the market for one year if the following years those stocks return less and ruin your long-term performance. What I learned from this is to try to find the right balance between stock picking and ETFs. In good times, I usually buy ETFs and I usually invest most of my money in the S&P 500. During a crash instead, 
I usually observe how the big companies behave, like Apple, Amazon, Meta, Microsoft, and so on. And if they drop much more than the market, I usually try to buy them on discount. But I stopped buying unknown companies only because I believe they have a high potential, because most of the time I'm wrong. So obviously, you can grow your portfolio tenfold, hundredfold within one year if you really find the right company, but you have to ask yourself, what is the probability that I actually catch the right company to buy? The lesson here is, Trying to beat the market is fine if you love the process and want to earn some experience. But trying to beat the market because you want to get rich quick won't work. Timing the market is another illusion we all believe in, but usually doesn't work. The problem with timing is, first of all, that markets can remain in a bubble even for decades. So imagine you think the market is overpriced and you want to wait. You might have to wait years before a crash, and in the meantime, the economy might be grown enough to even justify the bubble. And even if you are in a crash, you can't really know when the crash is going to end. Stocks go up and down many times during a crash, and they go up and down many times during good economies. But the most important thing I learned about time in the market is that not only it's hard, but it's not even worth trying. Schwab published a study in September 2023 proving that trying to time the market is always a bad choice, and instead, you should start investing as soon as possible. So Schwab imagined five different investors which received $2,000 each at the beginning of every year for the 20 years from 2002 to 2022 and investing this money in the S&P 500. Peter Perfect was a perfect market timer and places $2,000 into the market every year at the lowest price of the year. Ashley Action took a simple approach. Each year, she invested her $2,000 right away. Matthew Monthly split it at $2,000 into 12 equal parts, which she invested at the beginning of each month. Rosie Rotten had poor timing, or maybe bad luck. She invested every year at the worst, most expensive moment. Larry Linger, well, Larry left his money in cash. He was always waiting for the perfect moment to invest. After 20 years, here's how the wealth of our five friends look like. Even Rosie Rotten which always invested in the worst moment of the year, ended up with double as much money as Larry, which didn't invest at all. And the difference with Peter, which always invested in the best moment of the year, isn't even so big. Now, the next one is a big mistake that I've made many, many times, and for sure, you too. It's called sunk cost fallacy. Imagine you're going to a friend for a barbecue in the garden. You're halfway there in your car, and your friend calls you and says, man, it's raining, let's not meet anymore. So instead of going back home, you figure, well, I've already driven half an hour, I might as well just go all the way, you know, so that my half an hour is not being wasted. Well, this is probably a dumb way to think, and I don't think any of you will do it. Still, this is exactly what we do sometimes when we buy a stock or an ETF that starts going down, and for which we have no idea if it's ever going back up again. What happened is, we invested money in the stock, and now that we realize it was a bad decision, we start evaluating if we should sell it, not based on the future outcome we expect, but on the money we already invested in it. In general, when we don't sell a losing stock, we're actually losing twice. First, obviously, because we avoid selling a loser, which may continue to slide until it's worthless. And second, and this is even more important, I think, is because we are paying the opportunity cost behind it. Namely, the fact that since our money is invested in that losing stock, we're missing the profits we could do by investing it somewhere else. And rule number eight, the last one that I've learned at my expense is the importance of diversification. Only because in the last 10 years, technology has been the best performing sector doesn't mean that it's gonna be like this forever. As a matter of fact, the fact that it's even grown so much in the last 10 years can even be a signal of an overpriced sector that at some point is gonna crash or have a strong correction. Since we can't really know what's gonna happen in the future, the best course is always to buy the whole stock market and diversify as much as possible. All right, guys, these were eight rules of investing that I've learned in my past years as an investor. Let us know which rules you stand by and which mistakes you've made as an investor. And if you're new to the channel, let us know in the comment section below and don't forget to subscribe to the channel and drop a beautiful like. I wish you a great day, guys. And as always, I'll see you in the next video.